The second case on the docket this afternoon at the University of North Carolina School of Law, I'll just like to say that in the day, in the field, happy to be, is the County of Moore versus Randy Acres and Suki Farm. This is uh, Court of Appeals docket number 21-552 from Moore County and Councilor Ren, you'll proceed. Thank you, Your Honor. Uh, with the court's leave, I'd like to reserve five minutes for rebuttal. Yes. Um, may it please the court, I'm Steve Robinson. I am here on behalf of the County of Moore on a matter whose trivial origins belie the importance of the matter to the fiscal stability of every single town and county in this state that has unrecorded easements for infrastructure. Your Honor, this case arises um, from an action for declaratory judgment. That action was brought because defendants asserted that there was no easement on their property for a water main and a sewer main um, on the western edge of their property. They didn't merely assert it. They built a fence literally on top of the water main. They did this despite a stop work order from the county. They did this despite an explicit instruction from the town in the building permit to consult with the county. And in the face of that, oh, and they also, I forgot this part, planted a, a row of, head of holly trees on the outside edge of the fence, um, which is particularly problematic because as testified by the county's um, public works director, holly trees are particularly invasive when it comes to pipes, and these are old pipes and fragile pipes. So faced with that, the county did in fact have to bring a declaratory judgment action, seeking a declaratory judgment that it did in fact have an easement for water and sewer pipes that had been part of the city's or the village of Hindhurst integrated water and sewer system for many years. Let me just ask you, this is a sort of a parameters question. Yes, Your Honor. Um, do we need to decide, are you asking this court to decide what happens to the fence, or are you simply asking this court to decide the issue of whether this fence interferes with the county's use of the public utility easement? As an initial matter, Your Honor, the county is asking the court to reverse a ruling that the county does not have an easement for that infrastructure. And related to that, you did not ask, you had a motion for partial summary judgment. Yes, Your Honor. Because you were not expecting the trial court, and I take it you would not expect this court to decide the issue of the size of the easement that the county is alleging. Is that right? Your Honor, I believe the court has the authority to do that on the record, but if the court is not so inclined, um, that's certainly a position we would understand. And you asked the trial court to send that matter to the jury, didn't you? We did, Your Honor. Um, I don't know what would have happened had the county's motion for partial summary judgment been granted on that record. Um, if the court believes that the matter needs to be remanded back for further proceedings with regard to the size of the easement, um, we would be pleased with that. Well, we just decide what's you know what's brought to us, so that's why I'm asking you these questions. Um, and then just last one, though, I think. Is it your contention that the county has easements and access rights anywhere these utility pipes are running, whether they are recorded or not? In a word, yes, Your Honor. The essence of our position is simply this. Under the authority of this court and of the Supreme Court, an entity with the power of eminent domain that has taken possession and control of pre-existing water and sewer infrastructure is always, um, that is a taking. When there's been a taking, there is always an easement. And because there's an easement, the county is never a trespasser. And that is in fact the, uh, the import of our first claim for relief. In paragraph 40, the county specifically said that the county enjoys rights of ownership pursuant to its power of the eminent domain, of the manhole, water, and sewer mains, and easements that were on defendant's property. 
We ask, therefore, in paragraph 41, for a declaratory judgment that the exclusive remedy of defendants to any claims for compensation for taking the manhole water and sewer main easements would be an action in inverse condemnation, which is time barred by the two-year statute of limitations. Now, Your Honor, beyond that, um, under the case of uh, Burdaby State Highway Commission, these parties would not even have standing to raise the issue because under Burda, uh, the State Highway Commission in 1978, this court said that the right to bring an inverse condemnation claim belongs to the owner of the property at the time of the taking. Now, the Can you just sort of run through, and I don't want to interrupt your chain of argument, but could you sort of run through the, the time frame for us here of when this happened, those kinds of things? Your Honor, we don't know when pipes were first put into the ground, and that became clear as Discover proceeded. But it doesn't matter. What matters is this. Molassa, the more water and sewer authority, initially took control and ownership of the entire integrated water and sewer um, infrastructure at the village of Pinehurst in 1993. And it operated these water, these mains, as part of that system throughout that time. In 1999, Mawasa handed all that authority over to the county. The defendants, or rather Mr. Akers alone, bought the property in 2004. He then deeded that property, I believe, in 2012 um, or possibly 14 to himself and his wife by Don warranty date. I want to ask one, you just said, we don't know when these pipes were first placed there. Has, hasn't there been an earlier decision by the Court of Appeals addressing the issue of a public utility easement in Moore County? Yes, sure. Where that was an unknown fact? Yes, Your Honor, there has in fact been one. Um, that was Central, that was Carolina, or rather Central Carolina Developers Big Moore Water and Sewer Authority. And in that case, the affidavit said, um, from the county said, or rather from Moore Water and Sewer Authority at the time said, we know that these pipes were put into the ground before 1989, which was the operative date for purposes of the statute of limitations under chapter 43A. And that was sufficient. And the reason that was sufficient, Your Honor, is that the date of the taking is relevant to whether the statute of limitations is passed. It is relevant to the determination of damages if you're entitled to bring an action for, con for inverse condemnation. It may be relevant to standing for the reasons I previously alluded to, but it is never relevant to proving title to an easement, at least an easement ta taken this way by informal taking. All that needs to be shown is that an entity with the power of eminent domain did in fact take possession and control of the property. And it did so more than two years um, before the action arises. Where, where is the nuisance located relative to the, well, let me get back. In 2012, the county went to Mr. Akers and said, we need to attend to this utility. Yes, Your Honor. Um, at that time, at that time, was the location of the fence obviously because they didn't need to ask, they wouldn't have needed to ask permission to go there if the fence hadn't somehow been close to it. But why did the county request permission rather than just enter without permission and say, we don't need to even ask you because we have this easement? Your Honor, these were private contractors and they were working for the county who were ultimately responsible to elected officials. And under those circumstances, even if you have the power to go in there with a chainsaw and take down the entire fence, that contractor is always going to ask. And what they asked was, what's the best way for us to do this? What way do you want us to do this? But they were going to do it regardless. And you would, you, it would be your position that them asking those questions, being courteous, was not a concession that 
we have no right to be here. Absolutely not, Your Honor. Absolutely not. Now, again, what might have happened, being a general contractor, they probably would have called the county. And, you know, the county might have said, come in and we'll take care of this. They might not have. We don't know. What we do know was there was an easement. They had the right to do it. Just as Duke Power has the right to come and butcher my trees periodically because they're getting too close to the lines. Although I've noticed Duke Power never seems to ask about that. Um, Your Honor, the principles underlying this action were clearly enunciated by this court in the McAdoo City of Greensboro case in 1988. That was an action for inverse condemnation and trespass arising from a street widening project. And in that case, this court expressly held first that the sole remedy, and this is a principle going back many, many years, not just since the passage of, of chapter 43A, that the sole remedy for an influence for taking is inverse condemnation. And that this applies, and this is a quote, regardless of whether compensation was paid or proper procedures were used. These principles were um, subsequently applied to a case actually involving uh, water and sewer infrastructure and Cape Fear Public Utility Authority v. Costa a few years later. In Costa, the Cape, the Cape Fear Water and Sewer Authority, or rather I think they call themselves the Cape Fear Utilities Authority, wanted to come in and do a project in an existing easement that was shown on a plat map. The plaintiff, however, said that plat map doesn't have anything to do with my property. Um, and on that basis, he brought um, a claim for inverse condemnation, a claim for trespass, and a declaratory judgment claim. Now, the only issue that went up on appeal in that case was about evidence. It was about the admissibility of expert testimony. Um, uh, on the issue of uh, the party's intent with regard to the plat map. And the finding, of course, was that that invaded the province of the jury. However, this court, sua sponte, also addressed issues, quote, which should be dispositive of this action, but which the parties and the trial court failed to recognize. So the court deemed it sufficiently important to do that. And what the court said was first, trespass will not lie against an entity with the power of eminent domain. Second, the defendant's inverse condemnation counterclaim was barred by failure to comply with the statutory requirements of GS 48-51. Specifically, there's a requirement of a filing that has to be filed in the, in the Register of Deeds Office. And three, a declaratory judgment claim um, that no easement exists is in fact a claim for um, inverse condemnation arising under GS 48-51. McAdoo, Costa, and the other cases that we cited and the county's brief stand for the three interrelated pro propositions. First, that a claim of trespass will never lie against a public entity for using property for a public use within the scope of its statutory power of eminent domain. Now, why is that one important? That's important because when you, this is a declaratory judgment action. And when you turn the claim by plaintiffs that gave rise to it around, it's a claim for trespass. They haven't counterclaimed for it for reasons that um, are best known to them, but that's what they were alleging. Second, a public entity using property for public use within the scope of its power of eminent domain is never without an easement. It necessarily follows from the taking. When there has been a taking for less than a fee simple absolute right, an easement arises. Third, the principle applies regardless of how the easement is required, whether by gift, whether by, grief, by agreement, whether by condemnation, or by informal taking, or as the Supreme Court recently called them, um, upfront takings. Finally, it has long been established in the Stiers case going back to 1960, that when a municipality or public entity takes control of existing water and sewer infrastructure, a taking does occur. Taking these principles and applying them, the county met its burden of proving the existence of title merely by showing that the lines were in the ground when, when Moasa took control of them. Um, Uh, 
consensus. I don't expect that you to have a, a definitive answer, but I'm just curious. Why do you think the trial court was not persuaded by these many arguments, which I read in the brief on the motion for partial summary judgment? Your Honor, I think the trial court got off track with all respect to the trial court. I think it got off track because it wanted to treat this like a property dispute between private owners. And it wanted to see a plaque or it wanted to see a deed of easement. And because it wasn't seeing that, it was finding there was no proof. The other way though, that I think, and this is critical, that the court got off track is with the idea that it is necessary for the county to prove exactly when the taking occurred or when the pipes were put into the ground. And that was not part of the county's burden. It is unnecessary to the county to prove anything except that they were in the ground and Molossa took control of them. Well, the, the county has argued in its declaratory judgment action that it has an industry standard 20 foot wide is easement, 10 foot on each side of the pipe, if I understand that correctly. That's correct, Your Honor. So wouldn't you actually need to know what the industry standard was when the pipe was put in? Are you, are you, would this be a, are you arguing this would be an easement that would continue to grow? It seems to me it would be important to know, Your Honor, maybe not at this point, but at some point you're going to need to know when the pipe was put in to decide the scope of the easement. Your Honor, it actually doesn't matter. In Intermount Distribution, the Public Services Company in North Carolina, which was decided by this court in 2002, that was a declaratory judgment action to determine the enforceable width of a pipeline easement. Um, and this court reversed a superior court ruling because there was no actual explicit description of, of the easement in the deed. Um, the trial court ruled that the proper width of the easement was eight inches. Um, this court, however, held in keeping with longstanding easement law that the easement owner has all the rights that are necessary to the reasonable and proper enjoyment of the easement. If the deed does not, this is not a quote, if the deed doesn't, spec doesn't specify width, extrinsic evidence is admissible, determine scope or width of the, rate of the necessary easement. A rule of reason applies to that. Um, what is reasonably necessary for the easement? And indeed the court said, even when there is a specific width specified, um, it is assumed that um, Courts consistently permit easements to accommodate modern developments consistent with the purpose of the grant. Presume that advances in technology are, are contemplated in the grant of easement. So that gets indeed, Your Honor, into why we call it the dominant servant, the, the dominant tenant and the servant tenement. Because within the scope of the use, the easement owner's rights are superior. And you have the rights necessary to enjoy your easement. I didn't mean to interrupt. I'm sorry, Your Honor. Um, so just hypothetically, if next year um, the county of Moore determines, someone determines that the water and sewer infrastructure in the county of Moore has been worn out or that, that the population growth in the county of Moore requires the pipes to be wide, the pipes to be bigger, um so that that literally the pipes take up more space underneath mr acres property is it your contention that the width of the easement could be larger than it is today as a practical matter your honor i don't think it needs to be that much larger because the width necessary to construct the easement and to act and to maintain it is always going to be wider than the pipes in the ground. Okay. So, you know, we have an eight inch or a 10 inch pipe and if you replace it with a 20 or 30 inch pipe, it's still not going to change the width you need to get the equipment in there. Unless of course you need bigger equipment because the pipes are bigger. And in that case, yes, you will have to expand the easement. And yes, there will probably be litigation for that about that if it, if it occurs. That's not before us today. That, <laughs> fortunately, Your Honor, it's not before us today. Okay. Um, I would note, however, that when you have a lot of 100-year-old infrastructure in the ground in a village like Pinehurst, it's fair to say that such a project is not contemplated any time in the immediate future. 
you know, getting back to uh, an earlier question, the assumption that the date of the taking is relevant to the existence of an easement is how the defendants went wrong in this case and how the trial court went wrong in this case. We never considered it was relevant. Defendants did. So in the course of discovery, we did the best we could to get them the answer to the questions they were asking. That was not us changing the position because it was never part of our position. Only defendants thought it mattered. The county. Um, so in other words, instead of saying we object to that request for discovery on the grounds that it's not um, reasonably calculated to lead to the discovery of relevant evidence, the county just tried to to provide as much discovery as possible. Your Honor, I don't think it's ever good practice to refuse to provide evidence based solely on a relevance objection. Very well. And I assume that that's what was going on below. Okay. Your Honor, taking the foregoing into account, summary judgment should have been granted for the county and should not have been granted to defendants because there is no state of facts provable based upon the evidence admitted at summary judgment, in which a jury could possibly find that the county lacked an easement. It doesn't matter when they went into the ground because the county is, to repeat myself, an entity with the power of eminent domain acting within the scope of its authority as granted by GS 40-A3 um, for a public use. And that's all that's required. Now, of course, just compensation is required if it's a new project, that's, that's constitutional, but it's well established that that can be subject to a statute of limitations. Indeed, back in one of the many Charlotte Airport cases, um, the Long case, the court there specifically held that it was going to apply the statute of limitations for an inverse condemnation action that had actually been passed um, after the claim arose because the five months between the passage of the act and its effective date was enough to satisfy the due process and give people time to get their claims filed. So in other words, in that case, the statute of limitations was way more than five months, but it got passed at a time when it would give the landowner just five months to bring the claim. I believe, Your Honor, that prior to section to the passage of Chapter 43A, they applied the 20-year statute, the catch-alls, the catch-all statute of limitations to it. In some of the old cases, you will see them refer to that as the statute of limitations for adverse possession or the statute of limitations for prescriptive easement, but they're just applying the 20-year catch-all catch statute of limitations. And so the court was just saying, we're not going to cut that claim off um, under the step. Well, we are going to cut that claim off under the statute because there was plenty of time, five months. Well, the court didn't say plenty of time. I think the court implied it was barely enough time to comply with the requirements of due process and give people time to get those claims filed before the new statute of limitations cut them off. But now it's two years. But now it's two years. And it has been two years since sometime in the early 80s. Your Honor, this is not a new principle in this state. The earliest clear cut application of the principle. Um, Going back, I'm going to tell you what principle I'm talking about. The principle that a county using land for public purpose within the scope of its delegated power limit domain is never a trespasser and always has an easement is not novel. The earliest clear cut application of that principle that I could find was McIntyre v. Western North, Western North Railroad Company. Of course, it's a railroad company. Uh, 67 NC 278, and that's an 1872 case. Now, that case references some earlier public mill cases where a similar principle seemed to apply, but I will tell you, frankly, I don't know enough about the public mill um, law of 1800 to, to comfortably say that that was an eminent domain case. Um, but in the McIntyre case, and the other thing about the railroad cases, Your Honor, is yet that most of the time, their power of eminent domain actually got written into the charter instead of into a general statute. There was a lot, and so the powers would vary based upon the mood of the general of the General Assembly as, towards railroads um, and whether they were outraged by railroads or whether they wanted railroads to work. A lot of those cases dealt with the issue of whether 
the general railroad statute, which was passed at some point after a lot of these charges were issued, applied to fill in gaps or apply to supersede the condemnation uh, procedures of those laws. But in the McIntyre case, the railroad's charter didn't require it to condemn or pay for land before building. Um, the second thing the court held was that either party was allowed to initi initiate condemnation proceedings under the railroad charter. And this is the same thing that the Supreme Court held on many occasions under former chapter 40, that if there's a condemnation proceed, even though there's no inverse condemnation statute in former chapter 40, if there's a condemnation statute, that means either party can rely upon it. Third, in that case, that 1872 case, the court held that just compensation was lenders' only remedy for trust and that a claim for trespass wouldn't lie. Now, I'd like to address some of the contentions of, of, of defendants to the extent that I understand them. Defendants seem to feel like that this represents a vast expansion of state power. As an initial matter, no, it isn't. It has always been the law that an informal taking is permissible and indeed is a necessary part of the law in the domain because it's the catch-all provision. It's the cleanup provision. It's what occurs when the county has an oops or when the state has an oops. Rather than allowing even that, even without the county knowing it's done it, that's still a taking. It still means that no trespass lies. It still means that the sole remedy is an action for inverse condemnation. Now, is there anything legally stopping a jurisdiction from using informal takings to take everything? The answer is no. But the legislature understood that that is a political question given to elected officials who know better than to do it. And that ultimately the remedy for that, for an overbearing and improper use of the power is going to be relegated to, like, to the voters themselves to decide whether they're going to tolerate it. And county officials know this, state officials know this, and that's why it doesn't happen. Well, I mean, and certainly, um, and I think in Rubin versus the town of Apex, the town of Apex versus yes. Rubin, the land the landowner within the two-year statute said, this isn't, you can't do this because it's not for a public use. And the trial court said, you're right, it's not for public use. Quite right. And you lose. So it's not just for the legislature, right? I mean, a landowner can go to court to stop. Um, if it's not a public use, yes. Or if it hasn't been paid compensation, yes. Right. And those are quite rightly the limits that the court or that the general assembly deems um, judicial questions. But if the legislature intends for an entity not to have the power to take by any means other than specified, they will use that language. And they did not. What you see if you look at, um, 43, at chapter 43A-3 is that the power of eminent domain was granted. Um, I think we're I, getting into rebuttal time and I apologize. Well then I will stop. In the courtroom um, we have a light that flashes and you only have two minutes of rebuttal time left. Okay, great. Then I'm going to stop. Thank you, yes, sir. Thank you. May it please the court. Good afternoon. My name is Locke Beatty, and I'm representing the appellees, Randy Akers and Sophie Parent. There's two questions for the court today. The first is, has Moore County preserved any of the arguments that it's asserting on appeal about the taking? by presenting them to the trial court below. Well, counsel, you, you make that argument for ages in your brief. And I'm just wondering, it seems to be somewhat disingenuous of you to make those arguments when in paragraphs 40 and 41 of the complaint, they talk about the county's rights, the ownership or some power, in the domain, they talk about declaratory judgment for exclusive remedies for compensation. Seems to me that this was clearly before the trial court when it was making the ruling on summary judgment. Your Honor, 
I don't believe the issues have been argued on the appeal were before the trial court. Yes, the county did recite in its complaint that the county enjoys the power of eminent domain. So you don't believe that in the brief the county submitted to the trial court at summary judgment record pages 328 to 329 that the county asserted this? I believe in 328 through 329, the county asserted a theory of prescriptive easement saying that when Melissa transferred the deed in 1999, it's been over 20 years since then, and the county contended that it had a continuous operation of the property. I think that's a very different assertion than what's being presented on appeal, which is that the county performed a constitutional taking in 1999. Now, that, that, that may seem similar, but as a matter of constitutional law, those are miles apart. To say that the county condemned the property in 1999 is saying that is when the taking occurred. That is when the landowner's constitutional right to just compensation ripened. And that was not asserted to the trial court. So you're saying that even though the county in its complaint, and let's just be clear, the county is appealing not only the denial of its motion for partial summary judgment, but the county is appealing the grant of summary judgment to your client, right? Yes, Your Honor. And to grant summary judgment to your client, wouldn't the trial court need to consider the claims stated in the county's complaint, including the prayer for judgment asking the trial court to declare that the county enjoys the rights of ownership pursuant to its power of eminent domain of the manhole water and sewer mains and the easements, and that the exclusive remedies of defendants to any claims for compensation for the taking is an action in inverse condemnation, which is time barred. Wouldn't the trial court need to consider the allegations in a complaint before it dismisses it on summary judgment? Your Honor, I believe the only allegation in the complaint about when a taking occurred was when the lines were installed in the ground, which the operative complaint alleges was in 1945 and 1968. You can see that the pipes were installed sometime before 1993. I certainly would concede that they were installed sometime before our clients acquired the property. I know there was no pipes installed when they acquired the property. And do you, you have not argued at any time that this taking of this easement was for anything other than a public purpose, right? No, Your Honor, we are not disputing a public use. What we are disputing is the existence of a taking. And are you, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Now, this is the system for the village of Pinehurst, correct? Yes, Your Honor. And your client's property is there. Is your client using this? Does it benefit from this? Does your client use the water and sewer and all of this? The sewer line connects to our client's house. The water line connects to a different house. There is a water line in the front of our client's property. Can you just go back, because I'm curious. Why did your client move their fence? Certainly. There is another dispute our client has with a neighbor about a renovation that's occurring. And it's a separate matter, but it was causing the neighbor to back onto our client's property. And so our client exercised their property rights. They got a survey. They determined where the edge of their property was, and they moved their fence to extend it further down the property, as well as a few feet towards the property line. Okay. And in doing that, they made it so their neighbor couldn't get their car down to the garage that they had. Is that right? I don't believe it's prohibited, the use of the garage. It has stopped the neighbor from backing onto the backyard when pulling out of the garage. And was there, I'm just, again, curious for context, was there litigation between your client and the neighbor over the neighbor's construction of a garage? Yes, Your Honor. That litigation is continuing. So that litigation is still going on right now? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. 
In the record at times, I saw this fence referred to as a spike fence. Um, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but my understanding was that not just for the general principle of asserting their property rights, but that your clients moved the fence in response to their neighbor's construction of a garage. Is that correct? It's very close to that, Your Honor. Okay. Our, our clients moved their fence because the neighbor's renovations was causing them to trespass on our client's property. And our clients wanted to stop that trespass. And so they moved the fence and they also extended it to make full enjoyment of the use of their property. And when they asked, and they asked for a permit for that, is that correct? Yes, Your Honor. And the permit said that they had to uh, comply with what Moore County said that they had to do. Is that correct? So the permit issued and it said you must contact Moore County. Moore County has an easement. The, 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 on the back letter of the permit, it stated contact Moore County, they have an easement. And did your client contact Moore County about the easement and determine about the size of the easement at that point? Our, our client contacted the 811 number uh, for, and for that's the county where services. those pipes were. Is that what your client did? That, that's correct. Pipes were, there were lines sprayed for around the pipes, and our client hand dug any holes that were near the pipes to ensure that the pipes were not uh, disturbed. And when was this again? This was in 2019. 2019. And then your client planted some holly trees. At, 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 at some point after that, our client did plant holly trees to landscape, yes. Okay, and I think that I read in the in the deposition testimony from the from Randy Gould, I can't remember his name, Mr. Gould, I believe, that as Mr. Robinson alluded to in his argument, these holly trees are invasive, that they can be damaging, especially to older pipes, so that literally your client planted something that the, the county is saying puts in jeopardy um, the very pipes that are providing public utilities. Is that correct? Your Honor, the county's position, as, as, as its public works director has stated in his affidavit, along with the lines going into the ground in 1948 and 1965, he stated these holly trees could affect it. Uh, I do not know that. I'm, I'm not an expert in that. I do know that there were mature trees with deep root systems on the area where the county claims an easement from when our clients acquired the property. And so- And is it your client's position that the county has no right to do anything with respect to this sewer line for the village, which your client is enjoying the benefit of? Is that your client's position? Our client's position is that the, the county has not shown and does not enjoy a property right over the client's property. So the answer to my question then is yes. Well, the- The, the, the county has not shown and the county does not have any easement rights. Is that what you're saying? That's correct. And, and, and the reason why is because this is a takings case. Look, our, our client does not dispute that the county enjoys eminent domain power. Our client does not dispute that a taking when done by a public condemnor can be done informally. It, it doesn't have to initiate condemnation proceedings. It's not like a private condemnor. What our client disputes is that a taking has occurred that would put the private landowner on notice that its property rights are being actually and substantially interfered with, causing injury to the property. Well, your client knows and was on notice of the, the sewer line, was it not? Our, our, our client was aware that there was a manhole on the property. It was underneath the fence. Uh, our client doesn't have any awareness as to the ownership of the manhole. The, and your the, client was aware that they were using the sewer line for their own for their own property, were they not? Our, our client was aware on one occasion in the 15 years uh, after Mr. Akers acquired the property, the county came out and asked to access the lines. It requested permission. Mr. Akers granted that permission. The county lifted up the fence, and this was the prior fence. It was sitting directly on top of the manhole. The county lifted up the fence and uh, ran some liner through the sewer main and replaced the fence and continued on. 
So at that point, at that point, um, wasn't your client on notice that, hey, there's a manhole here and the county needs to get to it because the county needs to do some maintenance of some utility pipes. They're right under my sense. I mean, how can your client deny, clients deny that they knew at that point, hey, there's utility pipes under my property. And wouldn't at the very, at the very latest, the two-year statute of limitations for an inverse condemnation claim start running right then? So, so to, to answer the factual piece, yes, my clients were aware there was a manhole on the property and there were sewer lines. But the, the, the second piece of that question goes to whether that was a taking, whether the government was exercising its right to substantially interfere with private property and to cause injury to that property, property so as to oust the beneficial interest of the landowner. And well, I, one of the, my understanding of public utility easements, though, is that um, the landowner has all the surface rights to use their yard, to do whatever they want, as long as it doesn't interfere with the, the pipes that are underneath the ground. Um, I suppose, um, and, and I haven't heard that, that, you know, you're, I'm not understanding how your client's use of the surface area um, has been interfered with by the county if it's not a taking for a public utility. How has the county sought to take, to, to interfere with your client's use of their rights other than for the utility? Your Honor, I, I agree completely. I don't believe the county has interfered with our client's property rights. And I believe that's what has to happen to establish a taking. And, and I know that the county has explained in its argument, uh, it's just the fact of a taking. That's all that matters. The date is irrelevant. The date is extremely relevant. The, 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 the date that the government exercises a taking power, right? So, so it implicates the takings clause of our constitution. Well, when they put the pipes in, is that not a taking? So it can be a taking in two ways. A public condemnor can install pipes in the ground, and that is a taking because that is actually interfering with the landowner's property rights, causing substantial injury to it. Had a public condemnor installed the pipes, then I would agree that that is a taking. However, the law is very clear that when a private condemnor exercises the power of eminent domain that's been delegated to it under the North Carolina eminent domain statute, that's a very different situation. So the county's initial theory, and, and there's no evidence that any public condemnor ever installed these lines. And so the county's initial theory was that in 1948 and 1965, a private condemnor, an unnamed corporation, installed the lines. And the county alleged in its complaint and, and, and argued from its complaint all the way through our hearing on summary judgment, the date of the taking is the date the lines are installed in the ground. But didn't the Central Carolina developer's decision by our court establish that it does not matter? I, I, I read that case a little differently, Your Honor. Oh, please the, the, tell me how. So the Central Carolina developer's case involved a claim for inverse condemnation by the landowner. And the landowner wanted to recover from Moasa some value that it felt that its property was injured, right? So, so our landowners have not invoked that right. And the court's ruling, the court did not rule whether an easement existed. The court ruled that if any taking occurred, it happened when the lines were in the ground, uh, when the lines were put in the ground. And the, and the court was very careful in its ruling. It, it, at one point it says a taking could only have occurred when the sewer pipe was installed across lot 253. And therefore, any taking, it didn't say the taking, it said any taking would have occurred when the sewer pipe was installed across lot 253. And, and I think that's very important. That's the point where the property owner, the private property owner is put on notice that, that there is a taking if done by a public condemnor. But your clients, of course, didn't own this property um, before 2004, right? Correct, Your Honor. Okay. Your clients bought the property from someone else. Correct, Your Honor. The taking had occurred before your clients even owned the property. Is that correct? 
No, we, we do not agree that any taking occurred because the pipes were installed by a private condemnor. And the, the statute now and in effect at the time, and this kind of brings this case full circle because we had to go to the UNC School Law Library to get the version that was in place at the time, said that a private condemnor exercising the powers that, that, that the government gives it, the North Carolina's eminent domain statute, must strictly comply with condemnation procedures. It must uh, offer to purchase the land from the other private landowner. It must file a condemnation complaint. It must, uh, it must obtain a judgment in, con in condemnation. It must pay just compensation for the property. So if you have a private condemnor, and there's no evidence that there's anyone other than a private condemnor laying the pipes, if it doesn't follow those procedures, there's no taking. And, and, and the, the statute says strict compliance is required. Uh, that, that's in the commentary to the statute and it's addendum page 10. To is there another brief. option? You keep referring to public and private condemnation, but I mean, in the 1919 19 or whenever this was, the property owner could have consented to this private company putting down the septic line so they would have septic service, could they not? Uh, it, it's possible. First, we have no evidence of when the lines went in the ground. Right. But, but you I have no, you I mean you also have no, you also have no evidence of there ever being a condemnation, do you? It, exactly. We, we the, the, it's, it's the, the county's burden to produce uh, evidence of a condemnation. You see, this, this case is a little upside down, right? Because in most cases where you're evaluating whether a taking has occurred, it's because a landowner is filing an inverse condemnation claim or so by some other means trying to recover because it's saying the government has taken, in fact, a piece of my property. Well, when the pipes were put in, if it wasn't done by all of the regs that you say that should have happened, then it was a trespass, wasn't it? It, it, it would be a, a it trespass. Was a trespass then, and the cause of action for that happening happened at that time to for that loan landowner, didn't it? Well, I, I, I may have spoken too soon. The, the, the county's second theory, after, after it determined that it didn't have any unnamed uh, corporation, any records of it, was that Leonard Tufts, the developer of Pinehurst, installed the lines in 1900 and 1914. At that time, Leonard Tufts owned all of this property, and he, he was the developer. He started to parcel it out and sell the lots. And so the county took the position, which, which is correct. At the time you put the pipes in the ground, there's no trespass, right? Because he's just installing pipes in his own property. But when Mr. Tufts started to sell these parcels out, if he wanted to retain any sort of property interest in that pipe, he had to reserve an easement. But let's say Mr. Tufts was just, you know, not paying attention one day, signing these deeds, selling these lots, okay? He didn't say anything in them about the public utility easement. Um, isn't the fact that the county has been providing public using this easement for a public purpose, providing public utility, um, at least since, um, you know, 1999, um, regardless of whether Mr. T or anybody, you know, disclosed this to the buyers, isn't that the whole principle of eminent domain? That, that for a public purpose, for a public purpose, government can can use your property for public utilities and that your exclusive remedy is inverse condemnation. Yes, Your Honor, if the government takes the property and I, 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 if it's a public condemn or we are not asserting that it has to follow the condemnation proceedings, it doesn't have to file a condemnation action, but it does have to oust the property owner from so the benefit. in cities all across North Carolina and towns and subdivisions and numbers of places, I can imagine, where private developers are installing water and sewer pipe. Is it your position that in all those cities and towns, those property owners have a right to do whatever they they want? Um, 
they could dig right on down and um, chop up the pipes that are in the ground because there's not been a taking. I mean, could you know? Can your clients um, right now go just dig up those pipes and toss them out? So, they so have, are they legally in their rights to do that right now? Yes, if the clients dug up the pipes and, and tossed them out, I don't believe the county has shown any property right over any portion of the client's property to have a claim against them. I think in, in the so other instead of an inverse condemnation claim, maybe just people all over North Carolina could say, if you don't write me a check right now for the amount I'm demanding, guess what? I'm digging down and throwing out your pipes. Your, do that? your Honor, I, I don't know the extent of this issue. Your, your other question was about private uh, contractors installing pipes. And my that, understanding that are then given to the city or yeah. to the municipality. Yes, Your Honor. My, my understanding is in the vast majority of those scenarios, the, the, there's a condemnation proceeding. The, 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 the land is condemned and just compensation is paying to the, paid to the landowner when that right is taken i mean but that would have been when the pipes were put in would it not be i, I agree completely it would be when your client bought the property with the pipes already there that this that the county was maintaining i, I agree your honor that there is no taking when our county when our client bought the property so is it your position that not just your client but their neighbors who they're in litigation with and that all their neighbors there in the village of Pinehurst could call up the county right now and say, guess what? You don't have the precise recorded deed that I've heard that you need. And so, you know what? You better write me a check right now for the amount I say, or here I'm going to go digging and wreak havoc on your public utility system. So, Your Honor, I do Are not. Are all entitled to do that? I, I do not know the full extent of, 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 of pipes that are running without recorded easements. Uh, to the extent there is a pipe that is not inside the easement, I do not believe the court in this case has shown a property right to that pipe. And so I-, I So know, and the, the answer to Judge Inman's question is yes, with respect to this system. I, I do not believe such an act would interfere with any sort of property right of the government. If the government had some other claim as to uh, preventing the, the, the water infrastructure system from working, it may have an emergency power to go and, and, and replace the pipes, or it could perform a taking and actually install pipes. That's what the law says. Is when but the pipes are already there and your clients are using them. Yes, Your Honor, the pipes are there, and, and, and one of the pipes is servicing our client's property. But the important aspect of the taking is the ouster of the property owner from the, from the, the beneficial interest from the property owner. But is it saying you've got to move your, is it saying you can't build your fence until you check with the county and we tell you where you can move it? And the, the instructions they got when they saw the permit. Isn't that, if you say an ousting, a limitation on your client's use of their property? I do not believe so, Your Honor. They, so the, in the vast majority of takings cases, it involves an actual act performed on the property. Now, there are takings cases where the, 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 the government entity doesn't have to touch the property to take. And that would be uh, cases like Baroque Oil Company versus the North Carolina Department of Transportation. And what happens in those cases is it's, it was a regulatory taking. And the, the legislature passed something called the MAP Act, which says uh, if the Department of Transportation records a map uh, as a corridor map showing this is where roads are going to go, then there's a law that says uh, once that map is recorded, no one can get building permits on their property. So there's an actual injury to the property. When, when, when the, the map is recorded, the property loses the right for a building permit. And, and that hasn't happened here. If there were a law that said, when Moore County sends you a letter that says we have an easement, uh, you, you can't sell your property, you can't do anything with it, then I would agree that that would be a taking without an actual touching of the property. But the, 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 the fence permit issued, there's no law saying that no permits will issue if the county claims an easement. And, and the county to take the property has to actually injure the property. It, 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 it can't just say- Do you we, think the county ultimately 
um, wants uh, your client to remove that fence and that if your client doesn't, that the county will seek a court order to dismantle it? My understanding is that if the county believes that it cannot maintain the water systems under the current structure, and I would submit there's been no issues when there were trees on this purported easement, there's been no issues that I'm aware of since this litigation has started, the county would have options. The county could condemn the property if it felt for whatever reason that this situation that's worked for so long is untenable, it can acquire a property right. Well, but, I want to go back and talk about, you said in your argument that when they were getting the fence permit, that it just said they had to locate or, or had to come with the town about the locate or about it. And what it said is, in fact, that the applicant must contact the Monroe County or Moore County Public Works at the number, not 811, but at the number. A specific number 910-947-6153 and specific to determine waterline placement and recommended location of fencing. Correct, Your Honor. And your client did not do that, did it? Correct, Your Honor. Our, our, our client disagreed that there was any easement there as we continue to disagree to that. But did they say to the county, hey, thanks for the permit, but you know, you want us to call this phone number or send an email and we're not going to do that. So my understanding, Your Honor, is so the village issued the permit, right? And it said you should contact Moore County. And that was in 18, is that correct? I believe that's correct, Your Honor. Uh, 11, 9, 18. So at that point, at the very latest, your client knew that there was a problem with this fence. Our, our client was aware that Moore County was claiming an easement right over their property at that time. Yes, Your Honor. But I, I would submit that. The, and the, so if it's a two year and so two year statute of limitations is when? So, or you're getting inverse condemnation money. That's correct. There's a two-year statute of limitations for inverse condemnation. And your but, client, did your client bring one within two years of, of 11, 9, 18? No, and it is our, our understanding of the law that just an assertion of I have an easement, that is not a taking, just to assert that. Uh, uh, someone can send a letter or, or shout from the rooftops I have an easement, I've had it for a long time, you have no remedy. But that does not establish that an easement, even if it's the government saying that, especially if it's the government saying that. In order to condemn property, the government has to do something. It has to act on the property. And it can file a condemnation proceeding, or it can take property, it can lay a highway, it, it can act and oust the, the, the property owner from the use of the property. And nothing that has been identified as a, a potential taking date shows anything the government did to oust the, the landowner from this right, these rights over the property. And it's not, it's your position that your clients, when they, when Mr. Hickers bought this property in 2004, that he absolutely did not take this property subject to an easement. Is it your position that he has, ownership of that property and didn't take it subject to a utility easement. Correct, Your Honor. There, there's no easement on his deed. There's no recorded easement. There, there, there would be no indication to the purchaser that there's any encumbrance on the property in that part of the property. Oh, the fact that there's a sewer line running that he's using, that's not any notice to him? I, I don't think that's an indication of any sort of easement. And, and, and the fact that there's a manhole, the fact that somebody comes and says, hey, the county needs to do some maintenance on a sewer line in 2012, and we need to remove part of your fence in order to get there, that's not an indication? No, Your Honor, I, I don't think that the, the uh, private contractor coming from the government and asking for permission to, to lift a fence is a taking. It, it, and we have let your you have your time has run out but if you'd like to just take 60 seconds to wrap up we've been asking a lot of questions so. no, thank you honor and i appreciate the court's time today uh in conclusion 
there has to be a take. At some point, the public condominor has to impact the property's value in such a way so that the private landowner knows the government is taking my property. That is what the takings clause in the Fifth Amendment is all about. No public entity shall take private property without public use, without just compensation. If there is not a clear taking, if there is no instance when the private property owner is ousted from their property, they are robbed of that constitutional guarantee to just compensation. There, there, there is no notice, uh, there is no ouster, there is no interference with the property rights, and, and, and none of the county's actions impacted the, the, the value of the property. So, so the contention of the county is just because who was sending water underneath the pipes changed, that caused a 20-foot easement to spring up where it didn't exist before. Now, I respectfully submit to the court that the county has not proved its easement and the trial court's judgment should be affirmed. Thank you, Your Honors. Thank you very much. I'm going to try to use my two minutes, which I understand are not football minutes, um, and therefore we'll pass on. To address this, this idea that there was ever a difference between private and public condominiums under Chapter 40, if you actually look at Chapter 40, which they have appended to their brief, what you'll find is that in, chapter, in Section 40-1, it says, when we say corporations, we mean private corporations, and we need mean bodies politic, as in counties and cities. In 40-2, they granted the power of eminent domain to corporations, and they didn't distinguish between private and public at that. Now, this idea of strict um, compliance, that's actually a case note, a case annotation under section 40-11 which were the condemnation provisions. Now, the strict compliance reference there is in a con is the pleading requirements of a condemnation action. It has nothing to do with whether an entity with the power of eminent domain can take by informal taking. It just says, especially in those days when we were still under code pleading, you have to follow the provisions. And be before the rules of civil procedure and before the concept of notice pleading, and those laws are not in effect. And indeed, Your Honor, even today we say substantial compliance with the requirements of the condemnation statute is required. However, when you look at uh, let this case note, and I will say I've been doing this a while, uh, since 1991, and I have never seen a case note referenced as a cited as authority in a brief before. But if you actually go and you look at that case note in, in um, I believe it is under Yes, 40-12, petition filed, contains what copy served. If you go and you look at that case note, what you'll find is that is an annotation of two old railroad cases. One of them, Durham, North, Durham and Northern Railway Company versus Richmond and Danville Railroad Company was an 1890 case. The other one, City Southern Railway Company versus South and Western Railroad Company. Um, so a lot of railroad, be, um, railroad action going on here. Um, they don't actually seem to support the inference that this unknown ancient uh, annotator actually seemed to draw from. It doesn't say anything about there being any difference in public versus private condemners. Durham case addressed the question of whether the condemnation uh, procedures in the then extent um, General Railroad Act applied to condemnations under the Railroad's Chat Charter, and that's all it was. In the Johnson City case, that was an interesting one because this railroad got their charter, and the very first thing they did was they went and they tried to condemn an easement on a competitor's railroad. And there the court said no. You are not going to use this, this power of eminent domain to harass your competitors. That's not what we gave private companies the power of eminent domain. And somehow from that, this, this um, author of the note drew the inference that he said in the note, but it's not supported by the cases. It's not supported by the statutory text. And therefore, there has never been any basis for this idea of a difference between private and public condemners, at least under Chapter 40. And I think I've probably used my time. Thank you, Your Honor.
Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Council, for your excellent arguments. Um, this case is submitted, and this remote session of the Court of Appeals is now finished. All rise. In this session. This session of the North Carolina Court of Appeals is adjourned.